Batman Arkham Asylum is one of the most influential games of all time. It not only showed that superhero games could be more than just mediocre beat-em-ups or platformers with a hero or movie slapped on like a crappy beware of dog sign, but it also inspired an entire generation of third-person action games, from Middle Earth to Mad Max and everything in between. But when I see people discuss the Batman Arkham series, I always see this one go close to the bottom. So, I figured I would go back and analyze this game that I held so close to me as a child, since I wanted to see if it really did belong so low on everyone's ranking of the series. But before I start, a few things. This video will obviously contain spoilers, as I intend to discuss not only the main story, but also the side stuff as well. And I'm also going to be spoiling the 1989 graphic novel, Arkham Asylum, A Serious House on Serious Earth. And just like last video, I would also like to issue a content warning, but this time for extreme depictions of mental health, as some of the subject matter within both the game and A Serious House on Serious Earth might be too much for some people to handle. But with that out of the way, let's begin. The game opens up on a dark and rainy night in Gotham. We hear sirens in the distance and trash lay scattered across the ground until we see the Batmobile race down the street. Inside, we see Batman driving Joker to Arkham after a failed attack on City Hall, but Batman has a sneaking suspicion that something is wrong because it felt like Joker got captured a little too easily. We also get this nice pan-up shot of Arkham Island, not yet aware of how long this night is going to be. Inside the asylum, Batman tells the warden, Quincy Sharp, that he's gonna take Joker to his cell himself because of his suspicion. As we walk to Joker's cell, we get a gist of the asylum. The fact that Joker caused a fire at Blackgate that coincidentally got all his goons moved to Arkham, and we see Killer Croc. All of these things serve a very distinct purpose in my eyes. One of the most immediate qualities that you can notice about Arkham Asylum, at least in my eyes, is that it could be any iteration of Batman. So we just get these general ideas, these broader concepts, instead of the more focused character decisions present in later games within this Arkham verse. We understand that Batman has been doing the same song and dance with Joker for, frankly, too long. We understand that Joker is obviously in a place to have all the goons that he does. We see Croc, and it shows us that Batman's rogues gallery has already been established and fleshed out for the most part. It's all to service this idea that Arkham Asylum is not in its own universe or timeline, it's just following a general series of events. Like I said, it could really be any iteration of any of these characters. We also get a brief look at the Asylum. That's something I'll come back to in a minute, but for now, we learn that Batman's suspicion was right, as Joker strangles the officer that was walking him to his cell and reveals his master plan. Tonight is Joker's night to shine. It's no longer Arkham Asylum, it's now Joker's madhouse, and Batman is just a guest who will play in his twisted game. Within the first 30 minutes of the game, you're introduced to all your basic concepts. The asylum, the story, the characters, the stealth, and the combat. What makes the prologue so effective in my eyes is that it goes by so fast. It respects your time because the game guesses that you're generally familiar with the basic concepts of the Batman mythos. But with the prologue out of the way, I first want to talk about the asylum. Arkham Asylum is unique compared to the rest of the franchise, as it's the only one that's truly linear, but the linearity works in this game's favor because it gives us the best location in the entire series. Arkham Asylum is shrouded in this dense atmosphere that makes it feel like a horror game at times, with the Asylum making you feel like you're going mad, assaulting you with a never-ending labyrinth of hallways and corridors that all just kind of look the same. It invokes this feeling of dread or hopelessness that maybe you're just in over your head a little bit. All these villains are freed from their cells and you can't even navigate the medical wing. I love it. But even if you're like me and you know your way around the asylum like the back of your hand, it's still gross to look at. Not in the way of like Xbox 360 era stink that shrouded a lot of games, but rather the purposeful, worn down nature of the asylum. Madness is one of the central takeaways from the game and the entire island of Arkham has gone mad. What might have been clean walls in the medical wing at some point now rot with tiles out of place and color is washed away that is now a tint of mold. It's the only thing that remains. Intensive treatment in Arkham Mansion just feel lifeless as well. It's like you're the only person that's left. The lights flicker, but you're left with nothing but the sounds of your footsteps, the paper that your cape blows off the ground, and the chime that comes from the speaker system when Joker goes over the intercom. At least you know you're not alone. The Botanical Garden, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. It's full of life, but the plants have overgrown, leaving everything, even the sewer system, covered in moss and other plant life. It all works so well to create this always present sense of nervousness 
nervousness that every building just feels a little bit off. The reason that I think they went with a more horror-esque feeling with the game is because one of the most commonly cited sources of inspiration for the game was the 1989 graphic novel Arkham Asylum, A Serious House on Serious Earth by Grant Morrison and Dave McKean. The novel follows Batman as he's brought to Arkham Asylum in order to stop a riot by meeting with the Joker. The novel explores the asylum and its effects on people. It feels like it's not the inmates who are insane, but rather the building that is making them insane. We see that when we first meet Two-Face. Two-Face famously uses his coin to make decisions, a normal side and a scratch side. It's supposed to represent fairness, 50-50, a visualization of his two sides, evil and good. The book uses Two-Face in order to explore the idea of predestination and free will. It'll come back into play later, but in the asylum, a doctor has replaced Two-Face's coin with a six-sided die and tarot cards. In theory, this would eliminate the coin flip, causing Two-Face to be able to properly make better and complex decisions, but in reality, it's crippled him to a point to where he can't even use the bathroom. It eliminates a simple yes and no, and it makes him unable to decide anything. It breaks him. Arkham Asylum, the game, doesn't explore anything that intense throughout its relatively short runtime, but the closest thing we do get is within the environment and within the Chronicles of Arkham. The Chronicles of Arkham are stone engravings you find around the map. They tell you the story of Amadeus Arkham and his family's history, from the murder of his wife and daughter to the capture and execution of the man who did it, which all leads to Amadeus being admitted into his own asylum. The Chronicles come back to this idea of the asylum making everyone around it mad. Amadeus open the asylum because his mother went insane inside the mansion located on the island, but eventually he himself went mad. It's all kind of ironic. I like to think of it as the asylum itself making people go mad. It doesn't help the mentally unwell, it simply drags them through a field of broken glass until they eventually end up worse than when they arrive. Abuse is probably the central theme of these chronicles. Amadeus felt like Gotham was abusive towards him and his family, and when he tried to better other people, he ends up doing more harm than good by abusing those who are already mentally unwell, and then he ends up believing that there's no helping these people, only stopping the rate at which they hurt others, so he goes and kills them. Abuse is a common concept within Batman stories, often rooting back to the cycle of violence, and questioning if Batman does the right thing. We don't really get anything like that in this game, as the game portrays Batman as the definitive good who does nothing even morally objectionable, and I'm not sure if I'm really a big fan of that. Portraying Batman as someone who only does good and nothing even questionable is kind of doing a disservice because, yeah, he stops supervillains, but at the same time, he stops petty criminals who are just trying to feed their family because Gotham is such a shithole. He beats up the mentally unwell lunatics in the asylum, and he just tosses them over his knee and then cracks their remaining teeth out. If you're gonna make a story about abuse, I feel like it should come back to Batman and just question about is what he's doing really good, because we know he's the good guy, but he could probably do better because anyone can do better. That's something that I actually like about the graphic novel, because within the book, we see similar events play out in the form of flashbacks, with the story coming around to bats, because Amadeus' mother was terrified of bats and it caused her to go crazy. So in the modern day, Batman represents that fear, that insanity. But within the game, the Chronicles are actually just the warden of the asylum, telling Batman the story of Amadeus and how he believes that he's been taken over by the spirit and has been killing prisoners. My name is Quincy Sharp, the spirit of Amadeus Arkham. You have done well to decipher my story, and I pray it has helped you on your path. I trust that through my writings, you will do what is right. Please, I implore you, continue my work. This city deserves a savior. Continue my work. At the end of the tape, Sharp urges Batman to continue the legacy of Amadeus Arkham, but he obviously doesn't because, in theory, it goes against everything Batman stands for. He doesn't beat up the mentally unwell because he doesn't think there is a cure. He does it for selfish reasons, his trauma. What he does is selfish and selfless at the same time because he doesn't want anyone to experience what he did, having to lose a family member at such a young age, so he doesn't kill his bad guys. 
But at the same time, he just locks them in Arkham, which they don't get the help that they need because Arkham isn't made for that. So they always end up getting out again and hurting more people. It's a Sisyphean task, for a lack of a better word. But just because it's this constant cycle of violence doesn't mean that change isn't possible. It is. Going back to a serious house on serious earth for a moment, at the end of the novel, Batman is attempting to leave the asylum with the doctor that he saved. Joker thinks Batman should die, but Batman obviously objects, so they leave it to Two-Face now that Batman gave him back his coin. If it lands on the clean side, Batman leaves. If it lands on the scratch side, he dies. We see Two-Face flip the coin, but we never see a result. After a brief pause, Two-Face reveals that Batman gets to leave. So, Joker walks him out to the door and lets him go. But then, we cut back to Two-Face, and it's revealed that the coin landed on the scarred side. But, through his own free will, he decided to let Batman go for returning his coin, for making him whole. Two-Face breaks his role in Joker's twisted game by choosing for himself. Instead of letting the coin flip, letting the asylum be the deciding factor, he decides that he's gonna let Batman go on his own. As I stated, I interpret Two-Face as being brought back together, and now, with his clarity by having his coin back, he decided that he doesn't need it and chooses to let Batman leave. It's one of my favorite moments in the book. Arkham Asylum is very much its own character in the way that it's constantly changing, not only physically due to the events unfolding on the island, but in the way that it changes the people on the island, and this new angle made it fun to replay the game and look at it differently, but some things never change, no matter how many times I play it. Now, I want to talk about the main story and the characters, and why it only somewhat works in my opinion. Trying to pick apart the narrative to find things to talk about for this game was admittedly difficult. Not because the game flew over my head, but because the game knows exactly what it is. From a narrative standpoint, this game is very simple because that's what it was going for. A simple Batman narrative that anyone can sit down and enjoy. The game does have its moments. For example, the story makes excellent use of body horror with the entire Titan plot. Early on in the game, you see Bane is hung up in a room with a bunch of tubes hanging off him, and he asks you for help, a genuinely sympathetic moment from Bane. But right when his veins are filled with Titan, we see a small man that was hanging from wires like nothing more than a guinea pig turn into this giant hulking monster. After Bane is defeated, we see Joker is using Titan on his henchmen, except they aren't turning into these cool big luchadors like Bane, they're instead turning into these overgrown people with punctured skin, spines, and ribs hanging out. It's horrible. It gets so bad to where, in a last-ditch effort, Joker shoots himself with Titan and he turns himself into this giant hulking monster akin to something from Resident Evil. It's just gross to look at, even within the confines of a 720p bit-crushed cutscene of the PC port. But aside from that major element of body horror present throughout the game, the narrative lacks any major depth. We see characters brought down to their most basic forms. Batman is just stoic, that's his only character trait. He says about four lines throughout the entire game and has basically no charisma because he doesn't have a supporting cast to bounce off. Without a supporting cast, he's just left to dry. No Alfred, no Robin, and Oracle's only there when the plot requires her to be. Oracle, go through the city's computers. Pull up all you can find on Dr. Young. I'll go through anything you find once I get to the cave. A bat cave? On Arkham Island? I built it years ago. It's best to plan ahead for situations like this. How'd you manage to keep this a secret? It's me, remember? So do you think Dr. Young's been experimenting with venom? The same chemical that turns Bane into that animal? Yes, I'm worried. Bane seemed even more powerful than usual. Joker wants the venom, and that can only be trouble. I'm heading to Dead Man's Point in Arkham North. I'll contact you once I'm in the Batcave. He doesn't do much in the game, but the fact that he's voiced by the late and great Kevin Conroy really shows how well he fits into the Batman role, because even when Batman has the same amount of charisma and lines as the cheese wheel from Skyrim, he still kills it. Joker, on the other hand, is great. Portrayed by the always excellent Mark Hamill, he steals the show. Really proving that you aren't in control. This is Joker's asylum. He's always there, whether it be physically or through the intercom and radio system. He's always talking and cracking jokes, and it really allows this version to grow on you, since you feel like you spend more time with him than Batman. 
Poison Ivy and Ban are also brought down to their simplest forms. Ivy wants nothing more than for her plants to be fine, and really only attacks Batman because Joker injects her with the Titan formula. And once Bane turns into his big luchador form, any form of sympathy that he had just goes away, as he just wants to break the bat, since that's probably the best thing that he's known for. Killer Croc just wants to eat Batman, and Scarecrow just wants to scare him. They're all dumbed down to a comical amount to make this a very easy beginner Batman story. Harley Quinn's also here, portrayed by the late and great Arlene Sorkin. Unfortunately, she is completely useless in the narrative. She helps Joker to do some things at the start, and ends up giving Batman the thing that he was looking for, but in all honesty, if you were to replace her with a goon, nothing changes, except for the fact that they ditched her iconic Harley Quinn outfit for this skimpy schoolgirl-nurse combo that proves she's really only here to be eye candy for the audience. When you compare her character in this game to where her character is now, you just go and see this objectified version of a character that is actually now very great. It isn't particularly offensive, but it just goes to show this game's aged, and this game has aged in a lot of areas. Arkham Asylum has no intention of properly conveying the effects of mental health for anyone that isn't named Batman. Listen, it was 2009, I get it, but did we really need enemies that go down in one shot called lunatics, who have Hannibal Lecter style muzzles on their face while they frantically scream while actively trying to attack Batman on sight? It just kinda doesn't sit right with me after taking a minute to think about it, and the fact that the book that the game is based off does mental health so much more respectfully and better written, it's just kind of shocking. A lot of this game kind of falls apart under any like critical lens because any sign of a meaningful story gets thrown out the window in the last 15 minutes of the game because everything that's offered up to this point culminates in a giant Joker boss fight? It comes out of left field, and I get it. How else can you really end a game like this? There's not really a lot of options, but it reminds me a lot of modern comic books, where every time there's a chance something good can happen and we see something like a status quo change on the horizon, Either a big tie-in event comes in and changes it, or they just drop it because of editorial pressure. It's just, it all comes together for nothing. I don't feel anything when I see Giant Joker other than, are you kidding me? The worst part surrounding the whole Joker boss fight is that it's not even good. The entire time the game is telling you about Joker's awesome plan, just for it to end up being what it is. Disappointing. I don't think it's bad enough to consider the rest of the game void, but it does leave a stain that never really goes away. Even after I 100% of the game, it's just there. It's constant. Speaking of 100%, that itself was a bit of a journey, so let's talk about that for a moment. Or rather, the gameplay. Combat was obviously going to be a central part of a Batman game. He's a master martial artist. He knows every single martial art on the planet and has been trained extensively and knows the ins and outs of everything. So it only makes sense for combat to be simple because for Batman, dispatching basic thugs would be a simple process. That's where the free flow combat system in this game comes in. It's a simple process. You press X or square to attack and Y or triangle to counter, but the simplicity of the combat is what makes it interesting, because sure, you can just button mash, but all the fun comes from stringing together large combos and doing special takedowns. It was such a good and innovative system that, for a while in the mid to late 2010s, like I mentioned, everyone is doing it. Middle Earth, Mad Max, even Spider-Man does it. But I feel like Arkham still does it the best, because even at its most primitive in this game, there's still something so fun about the acrobatics Batman does in order to ice skate across the floor and kick a guy in the nuts. Despite the fact that in later games, Batman has so many more tools in his arsenal, it's still fun here, even in Asylum, with the nine or so moves that you can do, because the game is designed around that fact, so they only throw, at most, seven thugs at you, because it's something you never get bored of. Even after I beat the game and did all the combat challenges in order to 100% the game, the combat is still fun and simple, plain as. But the stealth, on the other hand, leaves much to be desired. Before I get crucified in the comments, at least let me say my piece. The stealth in this game was heralded as making you feel like Batman, but playing it, the stealth doesn't really hold a candle to any other stealth games or even later entries in the series. I remember the stealth being my least favorite part back in the 360, despite the fact that I love stealth games, but the main issue with the stealth is that it's unbalanced here. In order to make you feel like a predator in the dark, the game gives you as many advantages as possible. Detective Vision has no counter. There is quite literally no reason to ever turn it off. I'll get to Detective Vision as a whole later on, but right now you have no incentive to turn it off and it leaves the game worse.
worse. It makes the entire room have Battlefield 3 tint, and it shows you exactly where the enemies are, through walls, through floors, shows you if they're scared, and shows you which way they're even looking. The only way I think it could be more unbalanced is if it did the Spider-Man thing, where it tells you if an enemy is safe to take down or not. Later games much improve upon the stealth, tenfold, but even looking at it in isolation, there are very obvious cracks in the system that dumb down the game. The fact that enemies are dumb isn't an inherent deal breaker. Playing God as Batman would be so fun, stalking enemies and waiting to attack, but the AI for this game just makes no sense, as they just do whatever they want and tools like the Sonic Batarang just don't work half the time, which makes stealth even more tedious because you're forced to play by the terms of the AI. Unlike later games, here it doesn't feel like it's a battle of supremacy to see who has control of the map. Instead, you just play by what the enemies do and you just have to kind of wait, so sometimes these challenges can take a comical amount of time. But the stealth isn't bad, don't get it twisted, I still enjoy it, it's still fun, it's just unbalanced. Just like Detective Vision. Let me elaborate. Detective Vision is a really good concept. It makes sense for Batman to have something like Detective Vision. He's the world's greatest detective. However, the fact that it's so good in this game just dismantles the rest of the game around it. Here's an example. Much of my endgame rather hunting looked like this. Just me running around with Detective Vision on, and it's safe to say that a lot of people had similar experiences. So instead of taking in the wonderful environments the game is curated, you instead just look like Battlefield Vision the entire time, and it just ruins the whole game's aesthetic. An easy counter-argument would to just be, turn it off, but it's not that simple. A good handful of Riddler challenges require the detective vision in order to solve the puzzle. In order to effectively find and destruct walls, you also need detective vision. So unless you want to spend your entire time playing the game like Doom, dry humping every concrete wall until you find something that looks like it could be blown up, or you play with a guide, you have to use detective vision. And since I didn't play with a guide, I had to have detective vision on the entire time if I wanted to beat the the game in a timely manner. Now, is Detective Vision all bad? No, not at all. There's sections of the game where you have to follow, say, a trail of blood or a trail of fingerprints in Detective Vision, and it makes sense, because that's something Batman would do. However, any creative use of Detective Vision is immediately eliminated about halfway through the game as you're introduced to the Cryptographic Sequencer. The Cryptographic Sequencer is possibly my least favorite gadget in any of the Arkham games. You take away the need to solve puzzles with the environment or find a new way to unlock a door by having this device. It more or less serves as a quick time event that allows you to progress in the asylum, and here it's at its worst. In later games, the sequencer is used to solve a cute little word puzzle, but in Asylum, all you're doing is finding the correct wave frequency, much like the towers in Marvel's Spider-Man. And just like in that game, after the third time, it's not very fun. The cryptographic sequencer doesn't make it feel like I'm the world's greatest detective. It feels like I'm playing with a toy that just passes any need for Batman to, you know, be a detective. Slowing down the gameplay in order to be a detective, similar to something like Arkham Origins, would have done wonders here to better differentiate the gameplay. Once this tool is introduced, you're constantly being brought to a halt in order to play a game of spin the thumbsticks until the screen goes green. Thankfully, a lot of the problems I brought up within this section are all issues that have been fixed or at least made better in the sequels, but my point for bringing them up here is that it all comes together to not make a bad game by any means, but it shows how the first try is always important because it allows you to learn from your mistakes, and unfortunately, I believe that this game suffered so that Rocksteady could learn from their mistakes. The game ends with you defeating Titan Joker with an explosive punch, and everything on Arkham Island is restored and we see Batman go fly off to stop Two-Face, day saved, but the night never ends for Batman. There's a post credit scene that is sequel bay and it goes nowhere, and then boom, you're left on the island to go finish collecting Riddler trophies. I save this part for last because it's always the last thing I do within a playthrough, excluding AR challenges. And the Riddler is a pain in the ass in all these games, constantly harassing you to solve his riddles that are too hard for you to solve until you solve them, and then he gets nervous. In this game, we don't see the Riddler, but rather we dox him and then we hear the police show up at his house and arrest him. It's an end that satisfies, but it leaves future appearances open, which it's something that I actually like. Riddler is perfect in these games. He isn't a psycho like Paul Dano portrayed him as, but he's not as cartoonishly evil as Jim Carrey, and his voice constantly harassing you over the radio makes you want to actually go do his riddle so he shuts up. But the thing is, is that he never shuts up for long because he always comes back and does his little collect my trophy shtick. 
And the fact that he always comes back with more makes collecting them even more satisfying, in my opinion. Because, especially if you don't use a guide, hearing him get more nervous in real time is just plain old fun. Even with all the Riddler trophies and AR challenges, this game only ran me about 15 hours. It's the shortest in the trilogy, but it's still an enjoyable game. Overall, I enjoyed revisiting Arkham Asylum. I was able to appreciate the game a bit more, but also point out the very obvious flaws in the game. But despite those flaws, it's still a very enjoyable game. But I can definitely see why people would rank this at the bottom of the mainline Arkham series, because even with an atmosphere as good as this, the game's setting really just can't save it from the glaring flaws, whether it be the fact that the characters are dumbed down to the bare minimum developmentally, or the fact that the stealth and detective vision drags down the rest of the game, or the fact that the game has just aged quite a bit. But even then, given the things that I don't really like about the game, it's still a fantastic experience, and I still love this game, just like little 8-year-old me did all those years ago, but this time I'm able to just see it better. Uh, I originally had something else planned for the outro, but I kind of just didn't like it, so I'm redoing it here now. Um, first thing I want to say is the support on the last video was actually insane. Uh, the amount of positive comments I got and negative ones that I also liked reading. Uh, all those, those are, I, I enjoyed reading them, like I said. Uh, <laughs> if you can tell I don't have a script here, um, I'm just going off the top of my head. So from the bottom of my heart, I would just like to say thank you guys so much for now we're almost at 150 subs and uh, it shows that at least some people care about the, the garbage that I make. So that, that's a little nice. Okay, so I'm recording this part of the outro a day before the video goes out. I know I said I'd put this video out on the 12th and I'm doing it a week early, but that's because, well, I finished the video early because... I'm playing Suicide Squad right now, and I want to talk about that game, so I'm going to get that one out as soon as I think it's fit. It's still going to be my normal analysis type video, but I want to—I just want to talk about the game, because it's so weird seeing all the discourse online. I'm not going to spoil anything about the video, because I'm still in the process of taking notes and actually finishing the game. But other than that, um, yeah, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.